name I pray. Amen. We'll be there in a second. Um, you know, there's something about facing death. It's a sobering thing. Uh, some of us have been in those moments where we've known we are in the last few moments with a loved one. Maybe it's been at, at a house or maybe it's been at a hospital room. There's something very reverent and sacred and holy in these moments where you know this person is about to pass into eternity. And for those who are in Christ, the joy of that promise to being with our creator, our savior, our redeemer forever, it's a, it's, a, it's a special holy moment. We're gonna look at a, a, a passage of scripture today where they had already had that moment. You know, Mary and her family with her brother Lazarus passed away. Jesus raised him back to earth and then they raised him back to life and they were in their home celebrating this moment. And all that took place that Jesus was there. And so we pick up this time in Jesus's life where Mary anoints Jesus. And we see here in John chapter 12, starting in verse one, John writes, he says this, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was and whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance the perfume of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having a charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, of whom it was raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because of an account of him, many Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. You know, we, we see in here, there's an account, there's a word used there, denarii. He was just like, that's this, this ointment, this perfume is worth 300 denarii. Now, if you, to do some simple math, a denarius was a day's wage. And so if you figure 300 denarii, you're looking at almost a year's worth of wages that Mary was using here at this moment. Now you say, well, Paul, isn't there 365 days in the year? Yes, there are. But if you figure that 365 and you minus the 52 days of Sabbath, you wouldn't work on the Sabbath, you're down to 313. And once you factor in Christmas and 4th of July and Memorial Day and Labor Day, yeah, I'm just kidding. Those weren't real things back there. But the, the point is that this was literally almost a year's worth of wages that Mary has, was pouring onto the feet of a person and Judas was indignant, but Mary was worshipful. So let's look at this. The first uh, verse one, it talks about how this was six days before Passover. Now we know Jesus observed Passover with his disciples before going into the garden and being arrested and then, and then tried and beaten and those kinds of things. So we are within a, you know, a week or so of Jesus's crucifixion at this moment. So this is a very quick timeline that is happening here. This is also a different anointing in Bethany that was recorded in Matthew 26, simply because we know that the location was different, the person who did it was different, and then the way it was recorded of how Jesus was anointed was also uh, different. But they were definitely done in a proximity of time, this one to believe to be the first one, but both were done to prepare Jesus for his burial. Now you got some people who are trying to figure out, is this really the Messiah? 
Some people who are already chosen to believe in him as the Messiah and yet also know his purpose as Messiah, which is to die. And they know that Jesus' death is not only imminent, but is very close to the point that they are preparing him for burial. Verse two, there's a dinner served in honor of who I believe the hymn is referring to Jesus and what Jesus had done. So there was a dinner there honoring the miracle that happened that literally one of the guys at the table was dead and now he is actually alive and reclining at the table with Jesus. Now, I've been to some pretty cool dinners before where, you know, you go there and they're like, this guy was a, you know, a, a survivor of this and this guy had done this or this lady had done that. One of the coolest things was, um, uh, several years ago, I did the Bataan Death March. And as I crossed the finish line of uh, the Bataan Death March, I got to be greeted by some of the survivors of the Battle of at Bataan. And uh, so that was a really cool thing. Got my picture taken with one of the guys. And that was a really great honor. I can't imagine stepping up and knowing that I'm at a table where this man was dead and this man called him out from the tomb and they unwrapped him and now we're eating dinner together. What a different type of environment this was. And this, there was a dinner celebrating what had happened. Verse three, we see that Mary is moved by Jesus' provision of uh, bringing Lazarus back to life. And so she responded with a provision of her own. It says in verse three, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. See, Isaiah, Isaiah 52, seven says that describes why Mary would have felt this way because it says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Mary was at the feet of Jesus because she knew these feet were the ones who were publicized and bring good news and salvation to all of mankind. You see, there's no other feet in the entire world that were more beautiful to her than the feet of Jesus. Jesus had changed her life. He brought her brother back from the dead and Jesus had done something miraculous within her family. You see, up to this point, we've seen Jesus turn water into wine. We've seen him uh, heal a, a young boy who was almost dead. We've seen him feed 5,000 people, walk across the water. We've seen him heal a man who has been lame, crippled, not able to walk for 30 plus years. And then he heals a man who's blind, from birth, now he raises someone from the dead and then a week or so longer later, he will raise himself up from the dead. But see, Mary did not hesitate in what she was done because she knew Jesus taught these things, that her actions were revealed by the fact that where your treasure is, there's your heart also. And so Mary's actions revealed that her heart was a valuable her, 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 the, sorry, revealed that as she poured out this valuable treasure on the feet of Jesus, she deeply loved him and she showed it with giving a gift of her own self. See, notice Mary didn't go the young living approach. She didn't unscrew a, a little cap about this big and she didn't kind of do this and put it behind Jesus' ears for his headache or anything like that. Um, I don't know if we have any young living fanatics in here. My wife is, she has an oil for everything that could go wrong in life, including uh, better gas mileage for your car. Um, I joke, that's not true. I, I joke with my in-law about that. But you know, she didn't just go and get this little thing and put it in a little diffuser and say, that's it, there, there you go, Jesus. Just a little bit goes a long way. She took a pound of this ointment and she began to pour it on his feet and then wiping his feet, drying his feet with her hair. Now, as verse three tells us why she did that, I can imagine her going, getting this ointment, Jesus sitting down and she knows that this is the Messiah, the savior of the world. And, in, and assume he's gonna die. There's already been several attempts on his life. He's escaped for his life before. There's been threats or people have been standing there with stones in their hand, ready to stone him. And he's had to ask himself, are you, gonna, are you stoning me for doing a good deed? 
Like she knows that people are out trying to kill Jesus. She doesn't know when this is gonna happen. And there Jesus is in her home and thinks, this is my chance. This is my time. And so she goes and she gets this pound of ointment and sets it on the ground and begins to pour it on his feet and then wiping her hair with his feet. Now, she didn't just get a hair, or her, use her hair because she was like, oh, I, didn't, I need a dish rag and Martha's too busy right now, so I'll just use my hair. No, that's not the case. I can imagine her doing this and then taking her hair and, and unwinding it, unbounding it, and then taking the, the, the ribbons or the, the ties out of it and then using it to dry his feet. See, the thing is, is in the New Testament time, a woman's hair was referred to as her glory and her honor. The Apostle Paul referred to this in 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen 15, when he said that a woman's hair was a glory to her. So she was demonstrating how deeply she loved and how greatly valued Jesus was to her by taking not just her hair, but her honor, her glory that she would be known for would be her hair and using that to wipe and to dry the feet of Jesus. And then the response of this moment, which you think would have been this like, oh my goodness, what, what, a, what a special thing that we just saw happen here. And there's like an awe and a sense of you know, reverence in the room. Instead, Judas speaks up and he's indignant and he is mad and he says, you, you could have sold that for a year's worth of salary and you could have done that to feed the poor. You see, the, the reason why is Jesus, or Judas responded very selfishly because that's what he was. He was a selfish person. He would take money from the money bag and, and skim it from himself. The money that people would give for the ministry for Jesus, he would say, oh, this is for me. And he would put it to his side. And when he saw this, he saw a part of his prophets going away. You could have given that to us. We could have given it to the poor. He responded selfishly because that's his heart. But Mary responded with honor because that's what was in her heart. Church, I wanna remind us today that what the world sees as a waste, God can see as worship. I'll give you a couple examples. Our time. You know, our time. On Wednesday nights, we offer a discipleship night for our little kids all the way to our adults. And you're around your friends and say, hey, what are you doing Wednesday? Let's get together for dinner. You say, I can't because we, I've got church. You got church on Wednesday? Didn't you go on Sunday? Isn't that enough church for you? Well, maybe, but I'm going on Wednesday nights because it's a chance for me to sit down with a men in our men's Bible study or women or women's Bible study. I get to sit with my, with my wife in a couple's class and study the word together and, and break bread and have a, a, a dinner at the church and my kids get to you know, hear God's word and, and what you, the world saw was a waste of time of you know, wasn't Sunday enough. And for us, we could say, no, I, I get a chance to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ another time. I get to sit and, and, and be taught or even teach God's word another time. I get to share a meal with my brothers and sisters in Christ another time. So the world would deem as a waste God would see it as an act of worship. Well, the other thing is we look at um, our finances. Well, I get it, your tithes and offerings in general, and I get that, but I'm gonna take that aside for a second. But to look at like going to summer camp, wait a second, you're gonna spend how much money for your kid to go away for four days for a camp? What, what trade are they gonna learn? I thought, how are they gonna get better at soccer? How are they gonna get better at baseball or basketball? How are they gonna get better at their sport if you send them to a camp where they're just gonna sing and read the Bible every day? That doesn't make sense. Don't they wanna play in college? Does it seem like a waste of money? Or it seems like, it seems like a, a good use of money in that moment. Oh, see, what the world will see as a waste of money, we see it as an act of worship. To send our kids away for a week where they can be with their peers and great teaching and worship and draw closer to one another, and most importantly, Christ. We have our retreats. Our women's retreat was this weekend to send our women off for a week of our guys retreat coming up pretty soon to go and spend a, you know, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I mean, couldn't you go and do some work at the Deer Lease? Couldn't you go and do something else? Couldn't you do these other things with that time? You're gonna miss this, you're gonna miss that. But what the world sees as a waste God sees and can see as an act of worship. And there's many more examples, which is why we should not look to the world or man to dictate how we respond to God. 
We only looked to him and his word on how we respond. In verse seven through eight, we see Jesus rebuked him. Why? Because what he said was true. Judas didn't say something wrong. What he said was, this is a year's salary. Is that true? Yes. Could that money be used for the poor? Yes. Then why did Jesus rebuke him on something that is actually true? Because of his heart. It wasn't his words that he said or, his, or, his, or the deeds, it was the heart behind it. And the truth goes for us still today, church. We can show up for church. We'll be like, man, I haven't missed church in three weeks. You're right, you haven't, but have you really been here? You've attended, but have we been here? Oh, I, I, I did this, yes, but what was the heart behind it? Did, did you volunteer because you wanted people to see you? Or because this was a talent and a gift that God had given you and a need where you could serve and bless the kingdom of God? See, what Judas said was true. The facts were true, but his heart was messed up. Verses nine through 11, the response was just gonna end this once and for all. The Jewish leaders were tired of people leaning more towards Jesus than their way. And they were gonna end not only Jesus, but also Lazarus, because this is, this is now being a, a force to lean people to go more towards Jesus. Not we got the blind guy, we got the lame guy, we got the, the wine, we got the water, we got the bread. We got all these things going against us of people wanting to follow Jesus. And now he raises this person from the dead. And we were all there and we saw, we, we witnessed it. That guy's got to go too. And the sad thing is the Jews thought they were actually right. They had the law of Moses. They, they have what we have right here, guys. They just misread it. They thought the Messiah was coming later and the Messiah was already there. And they were trying to stop the very thing that their faith started. They'd missed the mark. So what's our takeaway this week? What's our takeaway with this, this scene where Jesus raises a man from the death and he is in a home celebrating that this man is alive and the power of Jesus is and Mary anoints his feet. What, what's our takeaway? First thing I want us to know, church, is let's celebrate what the Lord has done. Let's celebrate what the Lord has done. We are people that forget far too often what the Lord has done in our lives. Matter of fact, it, it comes across like this. Now, I'm not trying to throw stones because I've done it too. We're in a Bible study and we're like, oh, I almost forgot. And we give a, how the Lord answered our prayer. Why was it on the tip of our tongue? We will go through like, well, I've got this going on and this going on and somebody's to pray for this and somebody's to pray for that. And somebody go, oh, I forgot. And we just like, out of nowhere, we remembered, oh God, God did something great. I forgot to tell everybody. We just, it just slipped our minds. Why do we not, was that not on the tip of our tongues? We need to celebrate what the Lord has done. On our baptism shirts that we do, there's a, there's a white box at the bottom of the verse in, in Romans six. And what we would encourage people to do is go home with a, mar a Sharpie marker and write down your baptism date. Celebrate, commemorate, this is what happened in my life. And someone reads your shirt and like, what's that date? Like, that's the date I told the world Jesus changed my life. That's the date that I made my faith public to the world that I believe Jesus Christ has rescued me and, and saved, my, saved me from my sin. That's the date I told everyone Jesus saved me. And from that date on, I continue to tell everyone. We should celebrate and commemorate what the Lord has done. You know, we have birthdays, we have wedding anniversaries. And far off too, too often we not reflect on that moment where we maybe have walked the aisle or, or stood at a, at a camp and we gave our life to Jesus. We have a reconciling relationship and we don't celebrate what the Lord had done in the moment because we have to go back and say, oh yeah, things were bad before, but the Lord reconciled us. So we just kind of like, this is a moment we tuck it away in history. That should not, should not be the case. These people had a, a dinner to commemorate, to celebrate. Look, this guy right here, our brother Lazarus, he was dead. This man right here, he's the son of God. He raised him back to life. Let's have a dinner and honor of this moment. Second thing is this, church. Give your best to the Lord. Give your best to the Lord. Now, in order to, to explain this point, I want to tell you a story. Years ago, I was at a youth conference and there was this, uh, one of the communicators there. His name was Justin Lukadu. 
funny looking guy. He was like six, seven, real spiked hair, you know, bleach blonde. And he wrote a Bible study called Step Off, the 30 hardest days of your life. And I was like, that sounds awesome. So I went online and ordered the books. I went online at that time, really, you know, no one ordered things online, but called the Christian bookstore and uh, wrote, gave them a check and, you know, ordered the books. They came in the mail and distributed it to my students and my youth leadership team at the time. And we went through the book. And then there was a 21-day media fast, which means no TV, no internet. Cell phones really weren't a thing of texting. You could, I mean, if you had a really cool one, you could play snake on it and then answer, and that's about it. Um, or you could pay like a dollar and a half to send a text or receive one. So you got mad when people sent you texts. Um, some of y'all remember those days. Um, we were in that time. And so for 21 days, nothing, no media, no TV, no newspaper, no magazines. And I remember a parent calling me one time going, hey, I just want you to know I'm really unhappy with this media fast because twice this week, I've had to run up to the school and give my kid clothes because Texas weather changes and they needed warmer clothes for track practice because there was a cold front moving in. Or it started raining and they needed an umbrella because they hadn't been watching the weather. And so no one knew. Another parent came to me and says, hey, I just want you to know that my backyard is ruined now. Ruined. I said, what do you mean? They're like, well, I used to have a nice manicured backyard, but now it's nothing but a dust bowl because every night after dinner, we go play basketball as a family. And for the last 21 days, We've gotten in the yard and we've played basketball for three hours till sunset. Now we're looking at trying to put lights up in there, trying to figure out how we can play after dark. But my, my yard is ruined. I look back there, I see nothing but dirt in my backyard. I used to have nice green grass. He goes, I want you to know, I love my backyard now. Because as a family, we've done nothing but be together and play and spend time to one another. Well, in their Bible study, the reason why I call it 30 hardest days of your life is because there was one day in there where it said, what is something that is very valuable to you? Don't put your parents' house or your, or your parents' car on the list. Because remember, it's written for teenagers. And so they, you know, to put something that's very valuable, do something that is a prized possession of yours, those kinds of things. And you write it down. Then you flip over the next day or the next, the next page and it says, whatever you wrote down on the previous blank, give it away. There were several students who went back and was like, <laughs> two stories I want to tell you about that moment. There was a girl in my uh, youth group, her name was uh, Callie Wheeler. She had a CD collection of hundreds and hundreds of CDs. And this was back like Columbia House where you pay $10, they see you send the CDs every month, you know, that kind of thing. You try to send them back, but you don't. Some of you are like, what is a CD? And I get it. Um, but she did this, she had hundreds of CDs. She came to me and she says, I wanna give the youth group all my CDs. They're all Christian CDs. She goes, I'm gonna just give them all away. She goes, because I love music and I'm gonna give them all. She gave every one of her CDs to the youth ministry. We put up little things where kids can check them out. And, you know, Supertones and Ryan K and, you know, Third Day and all these different groups that were popular back then. And so kids would check out their music. She had nothing. She was borrowing her own music at weeks time. She was like, I'm taking this one and this one, sign it out and bring it back, that kind of thing. I never forget, I got a phone call from her freshman year and she says, hey, I'm at Wayland Baptist and I'm, I'm interning at the radio station and I'm in their music room. It is a huge room, floor to ceiling with CDs and every one of them are mine because I work at the radio station. And she goes, and then three weeks after that, she called me later. She says, I get to go on tour for a week and a half with Reliant K and do musical interviews with them and Switchfoot and other, other guys. And she's like, I remember three years ago giving away all my CDs thinking I just lost it all and God gave it all back to me. For me, mine was a drumstick. Mine was a drumstick. This is a, from 1993 DCI World Championships. This is two Paul from WMF Ludwig. There might be a picture on the screen. I'm not really sure if it'll come up or not, but this was given to me. Um, and signed by M.F. Ludwig. If you know who he is, he's actually the son of the creator of Ludwig drums. And so these drumsticks were given to me. Now, for some of you who don't know, I'm a band nerd, okay? I played drums all through high school. I was the second smallest kid in my class. I was this big till the day I graduated. Then I went to college and this happened. Then I got married and this happened. And uh, those things, I mean, it, it happens to you. And, and so... But I not only marched in the drum line in college, I got to uh, march on the drum line and compete in indoor competitions and those kinds of things. And then I taught drum line for about seven or almost eight years. I taught drum line and I taught private lessons. I 
played on the drums for many, many years of the church. I mean, I, I'm a drummer. Every Sunday morning if, during worship, you won't see me raised like this. You'll see me drumming on the back of the seats because that's, it's, it's, I just love drumming. I'm a percussionist. I love it. And so I had two kids in my youth ministry who were drummers as well. And they had, one of them had just come to know the Lord pretty recently and they were starting to really grow in their faith and they were a part of this youth leadership team. And I wrote down these drumsticks because I kept them in a plastic bag in my house. I mean, they were, they were special. They were on display. And I wrote down my drumsticks. And then I was like, oh my gosh, my drumsticks. And so I gave Josh and I gave Stephen my drumsticks. Three years later, when they, or two years later, when they graduate, one of them walks back up to me and says, hey, I know how much those drumsticks meant to you. I want you to have yours back. So I got one of my drumsticks back. And it's really cool because I'm a drummer. My, my Wi-Fi name at our house is Ludwig. You go to our house, connect to our internet, you're gonna need our password, but you know, it's, it's Ludwig. I have our Christmas tree is a bass drum shell. I, I, I love drumming, but I did not wanna give up those sticks because they say to Paul on them. I mean, who wants another stick with not your name on it? But they were so precious to me. I said, you know what? But it's, it means the world to me as I'm going to give it away. And I feel like what God has taught me in that lesson since then is a lot of us, we want to give what we're willing to give in a column and what we're unwilling to give in a column. And we'll give God the best of what we're willing to give, not give God the best. And Mary didn't sit here in this moment with knowing her brother was dead and now he's alive and going, well, here's what I'm willing to co- part with. And this is the best of those things. And so I'm going to give Jesus this. She says, of all the things I have, this is the most prized possession. And this is the one I want to give to the Lord. And I feel like when we say we want to give best to the Lord, we're giving best of what we're willing to part with, not giving our best. And I want to challenge us all today to give our best. And I'm not going to make you a promise that you'll get it back like I got my drumstick back and Callie got her CDs back. But I promise you this, you will be blessed because God will honor your obedience if that is what he's calling you to do because it's not about what you do, it's the heart behind what you do it. The last thing is this, is important postures of the heart are sacrifice and humility. When I say postures of the heart, what I'm really trying to say is the attitude but it's like saying postures of the heart because I feel like it's more of an intentional decision. This attitude is kind of like a, just a response. It's just kind of like a, a natural occurrence. It has a good attitude, it's a bad attitude, but for me to posture my heart, to me to position myself to think and react or respond a certain way, there's intentionality there and it's sacrifice to humility. So what we do for the Lord is not what is important, but why we do it is. Our heart, our attitudes, say more about that than anything else. The posture or attitude of our heart is what the Lord sees and that is what the Lord blesses. And what we're doing, is there sacrifice? Is there humility? Or is there a, re- is there a reason is we do something because we want something back or because we want to be noticed? What is our heart before the Lord? Are we more concerned with about the time what we've done at the church? Are we reflecting our heart while we're here at the church? Are we focused with like, oh, well, I was at church here and I was it here and well, we've got 10 minutes left in the message. Are we more focused with the time we spent at the church or the time we have left at church? Or are we focused with our heart with what God is gonna do in our life while we are at church? Because see, one day we'll die and everything we see here on this earth will be gone. And we'll stand before a just and holy God. And do you think he'll reward us for focusing on the temporal things or for the eternal things? Do you think he'll reward us for the things of his kingdom, things in his word, or the things we just see that will vanish one day? See, Mary did not waste what she had. She gave it up in an act of worship. And church, for what the world may seem as a waste, God can see it as an act of worship. Today, we're joined in the waters with Robbie and Presley. Presley's one of our young adults who serves in our student ministry. And she's coming forth today to make her faith public and known to you guys and to the world. Well, don't, it's 
it's not a, it's not a pool. <laughs> <laughs> hey, y'all. I'm so excited to be here with Presley. Um, she is such a awesome servant of the Lord with our students. She helps out all the time. She's just an inspiration to our girls. And I'm just excited that we get to be here this morning. And she called me earlier this week, and she's just like, I'm ready. I, I have been ready, you know. And I can't wait to share this with our church and what God has done with my heart. So, Presley, do you believe that the Lord, that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, King overall? Yes. Awesome. By that profession of faith, it's my honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ in baptism, and you're raised to walk in the newness of life. Church, at the end of the service, if we can minister to you in any way, pray with you, serve you, please, at the end of the service, when everyone's leaving, there'll be deacons and myself down front. We would love to pray with you or meet you or talk to you. But that being said, let's stand and let's close in a time of worship with our Lord and Savior.